Good morning again, everybody. I was hoping that, um, thank you for that beautiful worship team. That was, I love that song. Um, I was hoping that Carl would accidentally leave the cash up here. <laughs> I was thinking I might be able to pocket it while I was preaching, but alas, it has disappeared. So, um, Nike just recently. Actually, I don't know how recent it is, but I recently discovered it. Um, Nike brought out this idea of a wristband or an app on your phone um, because they have this motto, life is a sport, so make it count. And what this wristband actually does is you can set goals and, um, you can, and, re- and it records like a pedometer. It records your exercise. It records your steps and all of the things that contribute to how many you go and whether you get your goal or not and everything. And I was like, I was loving that, but... but The one thing that I like most about this is that Nike wants this to be kind of a worldwide inclusive thing. And as people do their exercise, not only does it count for themselves and what they do, but it actually goes on to this overall database kind of thing. And Nike's keeping track of everybody around the world that's contributing to their exercise thing. It's kind of genius, right? Now, I love that. Um, because I'm like, I could take three steps a day and my numbers are going to count to that final tally. And um, so I was thinking I might, I might need to invest in this. But the beautiful lesson in this or the beautiful picture I like about this is it doesn't matter how little or how much you do that day, it counts. And the interesting thing about that is it doesn't matter what happens in your life, good or bad, whatever, it counts. And I, I, I'm sharing with you today out of quite a deep uh, um, burden or belief that every single thing in our life counts. And because we believe in God or because we're seeking to believe in God, it, it counts not only for us, but it counts for the kingdom. It counts for God. And I just think that's a really, really beautiful philosophy. So thank you, Nike, for the make it count kind of concept. But how can we then take that and kind of go, you know what, good, bad, indifferent, it all counts towards something. And so my burden for us today is for us to recognize that even in the hard stuff, even in the dark stuff, even in the things that are hard, and even in the things that we wish we could forget about our lives, to understand that it all counts for his glory if we're in relationship with the Lord. That there's something that will come of that. And it's evidenced and it's powerful. So I think that we have something to learn from loss. And I just want us to take a look at loss today and not in a, in a morbid, sad, depressing way, but in a way that's like, all right, how does this count towards my life? And so that's where I want us to start because here's the thing about loss. It's universal, It happens to everybody. Nobody has exclusive rights on that. It happens differently, but it happens. And there's nobody that's going to be immune while ever you're living and breathing from experiencing loss in your life. So we can all sort of sit on a level playing field with this idea that loss happens, no? So it's not a question of if we experience grief or loss while we're living. It's a matter of when. And sometimes, how often? And so, I really believe deep in my stomach <laughs> that how, how we deal with it, our response to it, matters. And that's where I want to start us off this morning. Well, let me tell you, first of all, though, what we're not going to discuss. Because I think when we open up a topic like loss, there, there, there's always the question of why. And I'm really sorry to disappoint you if you're wanting to have an exploration or a debate or a study over why bad things happen, we're not going to look at that today. Because I think even though that is an interesting discussion and something that maybe we can unpack another time, we can all still agree that it does happen, right? So it's not necessarily the question of why. It's a question of what now. It's a question of what do we do because we have this thing that happens to all of us. And, um, and it's happened to you, and it's happened to me, and it's happened to the person sitting next to you. And so now it's just a question of what we're going to do with loss. Okay. There are all kinds of losses. So in case you're wondering whether or not you actually do get included into this, let's take a look at some of those kinds of losses that happen in our lives. Can you read that? Is it a little bit small? 
Because there's obvious losses right over here on the left-hand side. There's not so obvious losses. There's losses that are related to age, and then there's limbo loss. That's the, that's the categories we're going on here. So obvious losses, things like death and breakups and separation and divorce and losing a job and losing money and robbery or being the victim of a violent crime. So they're things that we all kind of look at and go, you know, that's pretty bad. Um, that's, that's a loss for somebody. And then there's the not-so-obvious ones, like moving or just losing your health or changing teachers or changing schools or success or loss of a cherished ideal. People really, really grieve when they lose a dream, their opportunity to do something that they thought they'd do, loss of a long-term goal. And then you've got losses relating to age. Now, all of the aged people in the room can probably understand that one. Um, you just don't get to do some things that you used to do. Limbo losses, things that are kind of just sitting in limbo land that are yet to be resolved, selling your house. Somebody that you're close to kind of just going MIA and you don't know why and you don't know how and you can't resolve it, but they're just kind of over here and they're not being the friend that they used to be anymore. And so you're sitting in this land of limbo, right? So that's what it means by limbo losses. So those are all kinds of different losses. How do you know that you've lost something? Well, the chances are you're going to go through the well-documented stages of grief. Um, you're somehow going to land in, in a place where you're in shock or denial at some point. You might be, get fearful and angry um, and depressed. And then there's this kind of next stage that's understanding and moving on. And that's where we'd all like to be living the whole time. Um, so there are stages of grief. Or sometimes some people call them um, a cycle. Of grief. Okay, so that's just to give us a little bit of a framework. But today, I don't want to spend all time, all our time in this kind of zone. I actually want us to open the Word of God, and we're just going to go through a story, and we're going to let that story speak to us. Okay, are you with me? Can we turn to the book of Ruth this morning? It's on page 160. If you have a Bible in the, in the pew in front of you, if not, just the book of Ruth, straight after Judges. And we're going to start there, and we're just going to kind of slowly work our way through this book. And we're going to see what it can teach us about loss. Awesome. Verse 1. Let's start there. In the days when the judges ruled Israel. Okay, let's stop there. In the days that the judges ruled Israel. I want you to know something about these days. In the days that the judges ruled Israel, they were the most dark, wicked, rebellious, obstinate period of Israel's history. They were surrounded, Israel, God's people, was surrounded with non-believers, as we often are, but instead of living in a countercultural kingdom kind of lifestyle, they were living in this, well, they sort of just succumbed to varying, varying temptations, particularly sexual temptation. And from one generation to the next generation, it just kind of proceeded in temptation. And things just kind of spiraled out of control. And it was just this really godless, wicked time for God's people, the nation of Israel. And Ruth, the story of Ruth, actually stands out as a little bit of a glimmer of hope and a little bit of light in that period of time. So verse 1, in the days when the judges ruled Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. Now, the land that we're talking about here is Bethlehem, okay? So we find a family in Bethlehem, which means, Bethlehem means this, house of bread. Did you know that? Bethlehem means house of bread. Now, this is one of several very subtle ironies that happen throughout this book in Scripture. Because in the house of the bread, what did we just learn? People are starving, so they're in the house of bread, and there's a famine in the land. There is no bread, ironically. And here's my question when it comes to the house of bread. <laughs> How many of us are in the position in our lives where we're seen to have it all? We have our very own house of bread. We have everything that we need. Um, we have a good job. Our kids are having, you know, the kids are good schools. Education's going okay. I've got my next holiday is planned out. And, and we're seen to be living in this house of bread. But for some reason, we're starving. There's a famine in the house of bread. Something's missing. There's some kind of loss. It just... It, it kind of just brings us back to the, the idea of who actually sustains us, you know? Verse 1, so the man from Bethlehem in Judah 
left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and two sons with him. So let's get to know these people a little bit. Verse 2. The man's name is Elimelech, and his wife is Naomi, and their two sons were Marlon and Kilion. Now, interestingly, Elimelech means, my God is king. It's another subtle irony because in a, in a couple of verses we're going to realize that Elimelech doesn't actually act like his God is king. Okay, Naomi means pleasant or sweet. Okay, so it's sweetheart. She's got a keeper of a name, um, unlike some of the biblical names we discover. Because wait for it, sons Marlon and Kilion, here's what their names mean. Sick and dying. Do not name your children those names. You know, it's like naming a son chronic illness and the other one terminal illness and, you know, calling them to you. It's terrible. So that's their names. And they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in the land of Judah when they reached Moab and settled there. Now, a couple of interesting observations. Elimelech made the decision to move. I just want you to note the context because when we, when we put that chart up on the board before, moving is actually quite a loss. Moving is actually quite a grievous thing for people sometimes. So he makes the decision to move. Now, as a husband, Elimelech is actually left with a decision to make. And he's relying on himself to make a decision here. As lots of men and husbands and people do, we rely on ourselves and the information that we have to make a decision here. He lives over here in Bethlehem, the house of bread with no bread, and he's now going, okay, I've got to do something about this. So he does what any good man does, really. He looks at the economics and the job opportunities and the upward mobility, and he decides to move his family to Moab. Instead of, he doesn't really want to deal with the underlying causes for what's going on in the house of bread. Okay, there's got to be reasons why there's a famine. But instead of let's, let's muck it out, let's deal with those, he's, he's going to solve the problem. He's, got, he's relying on himself here. He's got a brain. He's going to use it. So the interesting, you know, because we could sit here and we could argue, well, isn't that the responsible thing for him to do? But the interesting thing about that is God was leading his people and he would often tell them where he wanted them to go. And Moab was no place for God's people because Moab existed as a result of Lot having a relationship with his daughter, incest, and then them having a child named Moab and then then starting this whole nation and town and whatever called Moab. And so these weren't, these weren't good people. These weren't God's people. And this was no place for God's people to dwell. But you know what? Elimelech wasn't really factoring that into his decision. He was just relying on the information that he had to make the decision to move his family. So I think, and from this, I actually want to highlight two main things. And I'd like us to just agree on this this morning. So if you really disagree with me, you might have to actually stand up and get my attention. But please don't do that. Um, so there are two main reasons for loss. Sometimes we experience loss because something happens to us. And we can't control that. It's an accident. It wasn't meant to happen. It happened to us. We're the victim of something. And that is a very real, very horrific, often shocking kind of loss, right? Something happens to us. Then there are losses that happen because of us. Or we somehow contribute to them. We make a decision back here and we experience loss here. Or we make a decision just here and then quickly we realize that we've made the wrong decision. So there are two reasons why as human beings we experience loss in this world. One is because it happens to us and other times because we somehow contribute to it. And it happens because of us. Elimelech weighed up a few things when he shifted his family. But what's quite evident is that he did not count the spiritual cost for his move. We make decisions all the time without counting the spiritual cost. We make decisions all the time about our entertainment, about what we eat, you know, about who we confront or who we hang out with or who we run, what we run away from. And later down the track, where they're saying, why is this happening to me? What's going on? I don't understand it. I don't know why I'm here. And then if we just look back a little ways, we've somehow contributed to where we've landed in this state of grief and loss. 
Would you agree? We make decisions all the time without counting the spiritual cost. But could it be that Elimelech's decision had more consequences than even that? When he decided, when he decided to uproot his family and move them to a place that God didn't really want them to go, he made all sorts of decisions for his family. He made decisions about where they would fellowship and what kind of community they would have. He made decisions in that moment about who his sons were going to marry because they were only going to have a certain amount of options over here, who his wife would spend her time with, their education, their prospects, their future, their family was actually all wrapped up in the decision that he made over here. In verse 3, then Elimelech died. Elimelech moved to Moab so he wouldn't die. Ironically, he died. We don't know how he died. We don't know whether or not he had a heart attack or whether he got hit by a camel. We're not sure. The Bible doesn't tell us. We just know that he died. And, you know, isn't that true of loss? Isn't that true in our own lives? Something happens. No explanation. Moving on. The next day, the sun comes up. We get up. Ready or not, the sun goes down. It comes up again, and the days keep rolling by. And if you talk to somebody that's experienced significant loss, they will say that that is the most insulting thing about it because they're expecting that the world is going to just stop and they're going to be able to just sit in this for a while. But the thing is that everybody else keeps moving. The day keeps rolling on, and we have to keep going. We have to keep going, and there's not really an explanation, and there's no time to stop, and we just keep Keep moving. And Naomi was left with her two sons. We're in verse 3. So there's a tiny glimmer of hope for Naomi because she's got two sons. And they're going to take care of her because that's their job. And don't we need to just cling to those tiny glimmers of hope when we're going through some kind of loss? Verse 4. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah and the other married Ruth. Now, the story just gets sadder and sadder, really, because these women, they served another God, and this was not God's ideal choice for them when they moved, when their dad moved them there, but they really didn't have much of a choice, did they? Here's the story. But about 10 years later, verse 5, both Marlon and Kilion died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. Another loss. Some might argue the worst loss yet, because people will tell you all the time that no parent should ever have to bury their children. So she's lost her husband, she's lost her children, she's living in this awful time in history, really, it's a very, very corrupt time in history, she's followed her husband to a place that she didn't, wasn't really ever meant to go, and now she's burying her children. Is this as bad as it could get? She really now is in this space of just, ah. Uh, just utter devastation and desolation and desperation, I guess. But what I love about God's word is that the story is not sugar-coated. I know people, um, look, it's, it's looking pretty bleak at this point. What we're reading has the same brutal honesty that we would feel it with if we run smack bang into hard things in our life, difficult, grievous circumstances in our life. It's not sugar-coated. This is what happened. And so my question is, have you experienced loss in here today? I know people in our church who have lost children, who have lost spouses. They've had to make massive moves from other countries. They've had devastating ends to relationships, who have lost their financial means. Friendships are affected by things. People who have lost their hopes and their dreams, significant losses. And it happens just like it happened for them. It happens. It's just brutal and it's hard and it's honest and it just is there. But here's the big question. When it happens, because it does, what do we do? What did Naomi do? I'm going to take a little side note for a second because if you're sitting in this room today and you've just experienced a very significant loss, you you might be in stage one. Things are just shocking and you're numb and you're angry. 
And if you're in that place today, you are not going to like when I say the question, what do we do? Because you're not ready to do anything. And I guess I just want to say to you, if that's you today, that is okay. (laughs) There is a time for everything. And this is not, the purpose of this is not to push you through something that, and say that you shouldn't be feeling it. If you've experienced loss, you feel it, you're allowed to be there, that's okay. In fact, that matters so much to us that I want to say to you today, if that's you, we want to walk the journey with you. So if you're experiencing loss and you don't know what to do, and this idea of, okay, what do we do next, is just a frightening question, don't ask it yet. There will be a time. But if that is you and you want to walk the journey with somebody, we're well prepared to do that with you and I just would encourage you to come and talk to us, okay? But there will be a time and we'll end up making a decision and the question is this, what do we do with our loss? What do we do with it? So Naomi's been away from home, been away from Bethlehem for a long time and her husband and her sons are dead. Let's read verse 6. Then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah. Some translations say this, the Lord had shown up. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to her homeland. Naomi is in the fields of Moab and she hears a report that the famine had lifted in Bethlehem after many long years and God's shown up and God's being gracious and God's blessing his people. So... Like Naomi, when we experience loss, what happens is we start to listen out for where the hope is. We start to want to go where the hope is. In order to survive and get out of the numbness and despair, we need to go. Eventually, we need to go where the hope is. We need to cling to something again. We go looking sometimes for the last time that we felt solid ground beneath our feet and it actually made sense and so we're standing out we're doing a normal thing we're in the fields working not that I'm ever in the field working but I'm just doing my thing and I'm like okay I kind of see a glimmer of hope over here and I want that hope I don't want to be here anymore this is hard this is dark this is oppressive and I want out so I'm going to try and go where the hope is and you know what I know this to be true for people in my life some of you might know my friend my friend Julie and we were talking about this. It was, um, it was ooh, 12 years ago when Julie tragically lost her daughter, who was 21 years old at the time. And um, Julie would tell you that after the shock and the loss, as she was trying to settle into the reality of what she had lost, she had this strong pull, this strong urge to go home. And home for her was actually the north coast of North New South Wales, where she just wanted to walk the beach and maybe feel a glimmer of hope and maybe just have a sense of something making sense again, going there looking for God. And you know what? It wasn't a long-term thing. She wasn't there forever and ever. But in her search of just this hope again, God shows up. God shows up because when we experience something, we go looking for the hope again. We go looking for it eventually for it to make sense. And God does show up. And sometimes it's not a literal move. You know, Naomi was moving from Moab back to Bethlehem. I know I told a story about Julie going back to Australia. Sometimes it's just a shift in our mind. Sometimes it's just this movement. But there's this pull toward hope. There's this pull toward light. Verse 7. With her two daughters-in-law, she set out from the place where she had been living, and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah, in verse 8. But on the way, Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, go back to your mother's home, and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you, or other translations say, may the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead in me. With the security of another marriage, that's what she was asking for them. And then she kissed them goodbye, and they all broke down and wept. Doesn't that just sound like what girls would do? Break down and weep. We're saying goodbye. Naomi's taking, Naomi's taking a really deep breath. And she's doing something that's very hard and very noble at this point. She's letting go of maybe all that she has that's a tangible reminder of her sons and her family. The two Moabite women that married her sons were dear to her at this point. They were all she had, you know. And the thing is, 
at some point in our grieving, there needs to be a release. We can't always put a timeline on it, but it has to be there. There has to be this moment, this point where we sigh and just kind of go, ah, this is too much. I can't control it. I can't hold on to it anymore. I have to let go of it. I have to let go of it. I can't predict it. I can't cling to it anymore. I have to hold it loosely, whatever it is. It might be at this point when we relinquish all of our possessions or we stop trying to hold on to that person that doesn't want to be held on to or we let the bank call in the loan or we accept the disease that's taking over our bodies or we recognize that we can't actually control someone else's actions, whatever it is, we just need to release it. We just need to let it go. We can't do it anymore. We don't want it anymore. Uh, uh, We're sore from holding on to it. And there just has to be this release where we let it go. So what does Naomi do? She prays this blessing over them. And when she's praying this blessing over them, she introduces this small Hebrew word that's really very important for us to understand in order for us to understand the book of Ruth. I don't know why we don't speak in Hebrew anymore. <laughs> because it seems to me that for, for every one Hebrew word we learn, there's about 20 English words that we need to use in order to describe it. Like I, I kind of just feel like it must be just this incredibly rich language. Because every time we introduce one word, huh, we have to use 20 words to explain what it is. But she uses this beautiful little Hebrew word called hesed. And this is the summation. This word, this one word, is the summation of the most wonderful attributes of God. This word means this. Loving, gracious, merciful, compassionate, kind, overflowing with love and loyalty and blessing. One word. And she says, my prayer for you girls is this, I have nothing to give you, but God is a God of hesed, and I pray he would give you hesed, and that he would be loving and gracious and merciful and compassionate and kind, and he would bless you, because I can't, I've got nothing, but if you, even if you go back to Moab, my God's sovereign, he rules over Moab, he can bless you there, I want to give you this hesed. She believes a God is a God of hesed. And she prays it over her daughters-in-law, and, and she just clings to her said for them. So for you and me, when we arrive in a place where Naomi finds herself, when life is hard, when it feels like God is not actually a friend, but an enemy or a foe, when we will never have all of our questions answered in this life, in the life to come we will know as we are fully known. That's what Paul says. But in this life, many of the questions remain unanswered. But the one question that God seeks for us to ask is this. God, how is this being used to reveal you to me? Or even, how is this being used to make me more like you? Or how will you reveal your hesed to me, your inexplicable, loving, loyal kindness? How will you make sure that nothing in my life is wasted? Even the hard stuff, God, what are you going to do with this? Are you going to do it through people that you're going to bring into my life? Will there be in days that, that are coming that I just, oh, I'm waiting for? Are you, you going to reveal yourself to me through this? How, God? How will you do this? And this is the important question because the question has shifted from why, God, which we're not going to explore, to we know what happens, God, so how? How are you going to use this? How will you reveal your said to me? How will you make this okay? How will you make sure this thing that was never supposed to happen in my life, how will you make sure it's not wasted? Because it feels like a waste. Because it's hard and it's dark and it's dirty and it's shocking and it's abrupt. And I don't feel like this was ever what I was meant to experience. How? How? We have to cling to this knowledge that there's no suffering. And there's no affliction and there's no weeping and there's no mourning or shedding of tears or dark days for the child of God that has to remain pointless or purposeless, or without merit. 
It might feel like it is, but it doesn't have to remain there. If our God is a God of a said, I, I want us to arrive at a point today where we can see this God and believe it, knowing that this will change how we suffer. This will change how we hurt. See, knowing and seeing evidence of a said will change the way we grieve. This will allow us to go through things we hate, things that we don't understand, but we'll hold on because we believe that while we cling to God, nothing is wasted. Even awful, sinful, hurtful things that God never want us to see us suffer through can reveal his said to us. And nothing that happens because of us and nothing that happens to us will be wasted when we come face to face with the God of said. Verse 16, but Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and to turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. So Ruth says she'll stay. Ruth offers Naomi the same loving kindness, the same loyalty, the same has said that Naomi has prayed over her. It seems clear to me that Naomi's God is already Ruth's God. Look at what God's doing already. In a situation that seems pointless and dark and hopeless, already God's got, Na- God's got Ruth. And how? Through Naomi, a woman that's suffering. You see, God gives us, in our hard time, God gives us loyal people. He gives us people that are going to walk the journey with us. In our pain and our grief, there are people who will stay. There are people who will leave. There are people who won't know what to do with us. They're not going to know how to hurt with us or be with us while we're hurting. They'll leave, but there are people who will stay. And in Ruth's case, staying was of absolutely no benefit to her. She was young enough that she could go and get married again and she could set up life somewhere else again. Staying with Naomi was not actually her best choice, but she's doing it because she possesses this virtue of her said. And she is loyal enough and loving enough and willing enough to stay by someone's side when they're hurting, even though she is hurting herself. Wouldn't it be amazing if God's church, and by church I mean the entire body of believers in the whole wide world, wouldn't it be amazing, what would Papster look like if we were a people that showed her said to one another when it mattered the most? Loyalty, loving kindness, undeserving graciousness. What would it look like? Um, As my friend Betty and I were talking about grief and loss and what we hope to be for others, she said the most beautiful Ruth-like statement. She shared with me that her greatest longing is to be a safe place for other people, safe for their heart to be with her. And I love that. Imagine if God's place, God's church was a place where people felt like we were a safe place to be when they were hurting. In verse 17 and 18, Ruth says this to Naomi, where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts us from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. She gave up. Church, what you are seeing here in this passage is the power of the second family. Have you heard of the second family? And I love this because I know the power of the second family. I have chosen for my entire adult life to live away from my family. And not because they're bad. They're awesome. I love them. I miss them all the time. And so I actually often feel like I live in a bit of a perpetual state of loss. Just because I live so far away from my family, I'm missing out on everything all the time. But I have experienced the power of the second family. Scripture says, and I'm going to borrow New Testament language, it says this, it says you have two families. The family of birth, family of new birth. The family that's knit together by blood and the family that's knit together by the blood of Jesus Christ. 
The second family is the church. That second family are the brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you have a good family by birth and you have a church family by new birth, you are doubly and richly blessed. That's me. I'm doubly blessed. And even if you, and even if your family is not great or you don't have a family or church, church family is oftentimes more precious than the first family, some of you have experienced this. If you were to die, the people you'd probably want to look after your children might be your church family rather than your family of birth, right? When trial and hardship come, your proclivity is to run to your second family, not your first family. You run to your brothers and sisters in Christ, the church, your life group, whatever it may look like. And Ruth, when left with the decision to decide between, to decide between her family of birth and the potential of a family of new birth, the church that awaits her in Bethlehem, she chooses to go to a family of new birth. In verse 19... So the two of them continued on their journey. And when they came to Bethlehem, the entire town was excited by their arrival. Is it really Naomi? The woman asked. Verse 20. Don't call me Naomi, she responded. What does Naomi mean? Sweetheart. Sweet. Cutie pie. Pleasant. Instead, call me Mara, which means bitter. For the Almighty has left life, made life very bitter for me, or my life has been very bitter So Naomi, that's just actually, I find this kind of quite funny. So Naomi, beautiful Naomi, sweet Naomi, cute Naomi, lovely Naomi, she comes in and she's like, just, you know, I'm going to give you a new name for me. I'm going to call me bitter old hag. You know? She's like, I'm not sweet anymore. It just keeps getting better and better. So, you know, people, people might think this is pretty harsh with Naomi. But the thing is, and you probably know what I'm talking about, when we go through things... We don't feel like the same people anymore. We don't act like the same people anymore. And so when you roll into town where people knew who you used to be and they call you Naomi and you don't actually feel like Naomi anymore, you kind of just want to take the pressure off yourself. Say, call me bitter old hag because that means that when I rock up over here, you're not going to expect me to be anything other than that and that'll take the pressure off me. I'm just going to give you a new name. I don't even feel like I'm the same person. I don't even think I'm recognizable. And the fact that you would call me that is just kind of a mystery to me. So she's just being really honest. What, honestly, what's your first reaction to Naomi when she says that? Call me bitter. Life has just gotten hard for me. Because if you were to look it up in the concordance, most commentators, they take this route. You're not supposed to get bitter. You look it up in Ephesians, it says, don't get bitter. Hebrews says, don't get bitter. Don't get bitter. Naomi got bitter. Bad Naomi. You're not supposed to get bitter. Bitter's bad. How many of us today, though, are sitting here and we are bitter with God? We're angry. We're frustrated. We're upset. We're ticked off. We're furious. But unlike Naomi, when we walked in this morning kind of unintentionally broke one of the Ten Commandments because somebody said, how are you? And I said, I'm fine. I'm alive. I'm fine. We do it all the time. How are you? We're like, I'm fine. I'm fine, really. No, really. I'm angry at God. I'm not an atheist. I know he's real. I just don't like him. And that's what Christians do. We fake it. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Or better yet, we like the word busy. We use the word busy because we feel like it has a purpose. How are you? I'm busy. I'm bitter. I'm having a hard time. So if Ruth's virtue is faith, then Naomi's virtue is honesty, whether we like it or not. Brutal, harsh honesty, kind of bitter honesty, but honesty nonetheless. And I actually really love that about her. How you doing, Naomi? I'm horrible. My life sucks. But where is she when she says this? She's home. She's with God's people. She's returned. The equivalent is, is that she's shown up to a life group and somebody's asked her how she is and she's like, I'm not good. Where is she when she says this? She got with her friends and she said, you know what? I am not supposed to be where I am emotionally, but here's where I am. I'm furious. I'm not happy. I've cried myself dry. I've got no tears left. My life is miserable. I'm short-tempered. I'm wondering if God is even good. 
And how many people would kind of look at her and go, I can't believe she said that. But are slowly and silently kind of wishing deep down in our hearts, like, yeah, I think like that all the time. I just don't say it out loud. I love her honesty. I think it's really important that she's honest. She's teaching us a lesson here. The question is not, should we be frustrated or hurt? The question is, are you? See, in our grief and in our hurt, being with God's people is actually a really good place for us to be. And if we're honest, it doesn't feel like it because with God's people, there are still the orpers that are like, I can't handle it when people say that they're bitter and angry. There are those people. But you know what? You're home. You're with the people that are meant to love you with has said, no matter what's going on. So it's a safe place to actually be real about how I'm doing. When you are honest about what's going on in your life, that is actually one way that God is not wasting your experience because you might be giving somebody else permission to feel the same thing. You might be saying, I need help. And then somebody next to you goes, I'm so relieved. I need help too. I love Naomi for that. That's a virtue. I love her brutal honesty. And I would encourage you to be as honest as she is. There's a vulnerability in that. There's a lesson in that. Whether we like that about her or not, she's honest. So I'm going to end with a few questions. I'm going to ask you today, who are you in this story? Because I'm going to confess that I really love Naomi. (laughs) I'm a little bit like her. And if you're honest, you might confess that it doesn't matter what your theology is. And it doesn't matter how much you love God, at some point you're going to not be happy with him. Because he doesn't do what you want him to do all the time. Sometimes he doesn't do what he's told. Just feels like he does what he wants and it's not what we wanted. Just like it wasn't what Naomi wanted. Are you like Elimelech? You know, something's going on over here, so I'm just going to weigh up my options. I'm going to look out for the best escape route and not actually deal with what's going on in my pain and in my loss. I'm actually going to get out of there and make some massive decisions and they're going to implicate other people. Are you like Elimelech? Or are you like Ruth, ever so loyal, ever so ready with the Hesed kind of loyalty and compassion? Everybody in here has experienced loss. So in light of the fact that we know that to be true, here's a couple of questions. What course have we set for ourselves that we are now dealing with the consequences for? Because we know that grief happens, why? For two reasons. One, because something happens to us or because something happens and we contribute to it. So I'm talking about the loss that's happening because somehow we've done something that contributes to it. What course have you set for yourself that we're now dealing with the consequences for? Because the chances are we'll be feeling a bit of a sense of a loss. What can we do with that so it's not a waste? Can we, honest, can we be honest about it? Can we look at our lives and go, okay, I'm here now because I made a decision down there. All right, Lord, how can you not waste my error? I own it. It was mine. Don't waste it. What are you going to do with me to make sure everything is used for your glory, God? What events have happened to us and left us looking up at the silent sky crying out, why? Why? I don't get this. Why? Let's be sure to remember the why moments, church. Let's be sure to remember those moments so we can celebrate them when they turn into something else, because they will. Or let's be sure that this is when our faith kicks in and we cling white knuckle to the idea that we serve a God who of a said, who is bigger than our why. We serve a God of has said, who actually allows our why to turn into a how, and we can start asking God, how are you going to use this? We want to celebrate those why moments. Have you ever run away from a place where you were meant to stay and stick it out and deal with the deeper reasons and issues for the loss that you've experienced? Because if that's you today and you're like, yep, I ran away, I'm going to say something you might not like. I'm going to say to you, maybe you need to go back to Bethlehem, to your house of bread, and starve there for a little while. And just wait for the Lord to bring you your how. 
Have you run off to Moab when you should have stayed in Bethlehem when food was hard to come by? Grief, pain, loss, the inevitable things of this life, the the depressing things of this life, the things that we'd often prefer not to talk about, you know what they are? They're a very visible platform for God to show up. And he has a stage. And he's going to show up. My friend Memory was willing to open up her life to me a little while ago after having lost her husband Arno a few years ago. I'm going to quote memory this morning. I'm going to share with you out of her journey, and this is what she said to me. I've come to the conclusion that grief is not black or white and find it difficult to subscribe to an all-or-nothing thinking. My story continues to unfold. I happen to be enjoying a period of equilibrium and peace. But like I said to you, Kira, it's like I'm sitting on a mountaintop and can see the course my life has taken. I can see where I came from and where I'm going. And I'm mindful that it may not always be like this. For me, Arno's death changed everything. And listen to what she says here. She says, I had no control over the circumstances that led to his death. However, I believe I have the power to choose how I would respond in the face of loss. I feel grateful for the gifts that I've received along the way. And I'm still learning to comprehend how much Arno loved us and how he chose to sacrifice his life so we can experience life with God. For a long time after his passing, I felt a void, an emptiness in my life, and I was so afraid But my journey took me right to that place. I came face to face with the darkness, the pain, the suffering. And once I stepped into that void, I stepped into God's presence. Could it be that this life in its entirety is about us seeing God's hand, his character, his goodness, his kindness, his healing, his has said. What if without loss and without grief, we might never catch a glimpse of him, not really? I want these next few moments to be a very profound healing time for you. And Moala is going to sing a song to us. And throughout it, I want you to be just really true and honest about who you are and where you are. Maybe you've identified with a character in the story. Maybe you've identified with the fact that you need to go back to Bethlehem. Maybe you need to turn your why into a how. I don't know who you are in the story, but I'm just going to ask that you try and identify who you are in the story. What place you're in when it comes to pain and loss. And in these few moments, I really just want to I just want you to be open and for you to allow God just to wash over you, just to shine a little bit of light onto the darkness for you. I just want him to meet you there and I want him to assure you and I'm praying he will assure you that nothing in your life is wasted. We allow him to do that in those next few minutes. Just allow him to wash over you while the song plays.